in and out, in and out, how we be moving. All oh, get no break, y'all, we be cruising. You and I. Attitude Era may have been in the rear view, but Vince McMahon and co were still peddling a product that frequently bordered on the insensitive, offensive, and downright nasty. It may have been a time for transition, but WWE still knew, or thought they knew, what would pique viewers' curiosity and get people talking, whether the reaction was positive or negative. Storylines centered around sex, Bro, violence, right race, here and a host crazy. of other hot-button topics were fairly common and are rarely remembered fondly today. I'm in the mood to feel bad about my childhood, so let's reminisce before the WWE Network on Peacock scrubs all the footage from existence. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these these are the 10 most controversial WWE Ruthless Aggression storylines. Join us. Number 10, JBL at the border. Injuries to Big Show and Kurt Angle and the departure of Brock Lesnar. Let me tell you what. What a great villain JBL was. Lesnar meant that WWE champion Eddie Guerrero didn't have any top line heels what to work with villain, following bro. WrestleMania 20. So WWE decided to create a new one, transforming Bradshaw into JBL. The Texan needed heat and needed it quickly, so he and WWE went the cheap route just a couple of weeks into the character's life. On the April 8th, 2004 edition of SmackDown, JBL was shown at the Mexican border chasing off supposedly illegal this immigrants who were nuts. trying to cross over. Now, it wasn't actually the US-Mexico border, but rather a ranch that belonged to Bradshaw's family friend, but the segment was still shocking. JBL continued to rail against Mexican people in his promos after, too, in a bid to goad Latino heat. An unapologetic heel who was willing to try anything possible to draw interest and make sure the character worked, JBL continued to up the ante and caught controversy in the weeks that followed, Goose stepping at a German live event and causing Eddie's mother to have a heart attack in an El Paso house show. You can't say these stunts and storylines didn't work because JBL soon became a long reigning WWE champion, but they certainly weren't in good taste. Number nine, the filthy animal. Man, that motherfucker, that bro, listen. I never, when, when JBL stepped up and became like a main event person, I was like, I never looked at him like this. But I was like, damn, that motherfucker's good, bro. And I know we, we, we looked at the finishers. Bro, the clothesline from hell is a top-tier five-star finisher. I don't give a fuck how it looked on the YouTube videos. You watch that bitch in person. The clothesline from hell is a great move because he made that bitch look devastating, bro. When you're trying to establish your next big star babyface of the company, it's probably not advisable to write them into a storyline where they're accused of sexual harassment. Just a heads up for any would-be wrestling promoters or writers out there. That's the fate that befell Batista in late 2005 when he was put into a short-term feud with Eminem, who were defending their tag team titles against The Animal and Rey Mysterio. In an attempt to dissuade Big Day from destroying her team, Melina seduced and then supposedly slept with the this! world heavyweight champion. Far from being dissuaded, Batista thanked Melina for the warm-up and pledged to destroy Mercury and Nitro later, which he did. Things took a turn, though, when Melina held a press conference after the fact, claiming that Batista had actually harassed her, which forced a similar press conference from him, professing his innocence. It was all very icky, especially when Melina and Batista were being spoken of as a couple behind the scenes, despite the fact that she was publicly in a relationship with Nitro. In the end, the storyline was all a setup for Batista's feud with Mark Henry, who was enlisted as Melina's personal protection. To make matters worse, that feud never actually ended up happening, because old Drax the Destroyer got injured before they could make it to the ring. Number eight, not his fault. The relationship between Kane and Lita in 2004 was your I don't classic remember this one love like this story. Real. Boy meets girl. Girl is terrified of boy. Oh, boy I do remember that. girl and ties her up backstage. Boy impregnates girl against her will. Boy destroys boyfriend of girl. Girl is forced to marry boy. I don't girl remember has miscarriage this on live TV. All right, so it might not be a classic love story, but it's still a love story, damn it. And it took up, quite frankly, an insane amount of WWE screen time in 2004. Honestly, so many aspects of the Lita Kane Matt Hardy Edge affair were controversial for different reasons, but it was the flame haired daredevil losing her unborn child on an episode of Raw that really upset people. And with good reason. Oh my god, he's not seen Evan! Look at Kane, bro. Dog. 
reason, since that's the sort of real-life tragedy that many have experience with and probably don't want to be reminded of when they're tuning into a wrestling show. WWE should have known better, too, having previously attracted condemnation for a similar storyline with Terry Runnels several years earlier, during the Vince Russo Attitude Era peak. The saga didn't do anybody besides Gene Snitsky any favors, and it just felt like WWE trying well, to be that edgy just for kicking the a sake baby. of it. Number seven, Tim White's lunchtime suicides. When Tim White injured his shoulder inside Hell in a Cell at Judgment Day 2002, forcing him to retire from active duty, WWE decided to make the best of a bad situation. And by best, I of course mean introducing him as an on-screen character over three years later in a series of pointless, reprehensible skits. White resurfaced at Armageddon 2005, being interviewed by Josh Matthews at his bar, The Friendly Tap, which incidentally was the one the APA would always destroy in their televised bar room. Oh, I remember Timmy him. was portrayed as a bitter alcoholic who blamed the Hell in a Cell for ruining his life. He then took a shotgun out and, off-camera, supposedly shot himself to death. Not only did some think making a wrestling angle out of suicide to be in poor taste, but this was coming just a little over one month after the tragic death of the beloved Eddie Guerrero, the who was very was much it? in the hearts and minds of fans at the time. WWE revealed a few weeks later that White had actually shot himself in the foot, but then proceeded to air several other similar scenes, like the worst version of Harold and Maud you've ever seen. The lunchtime suicides became a weekly WWE.com feature, ending when the former official blasted Matthews away. Well, at least it had a happy ending, I suppose. Number six, Muhammad Hassan, seven. Wait, what the fuck you mean, blasted Matthews away? Okay. You niggas was doing something? I don't want to know. Seven. Sometimes timing is everything. Careers have been made thanks to a superstar being in the right place at the right time. Come to think of it, that's what happened with Big Snitsky, whose entire WWE run was predicated on it not being his fault. Conversely, bad timing can be a career ender, something you need only ask the man who portrayed the villainous Muhammad Hassan. Hassan enjoyed a meteoric rise up the ranks, working with everyone from Shawn Michaels and Steve Austin to Hulk Hogan and The Undertaker in his short we already talked about career. This. Yeah. Regrettably, just months into his tenure, Hassan was written out of storylines at the behest of the UPN network because of an angle that took place on SmackDown. In it, Hassan's masked henchman attacked Taker and attempted to garrote him with piano wire before carrying off Muhammad's manager Davari Nigga. Marta style. It would have been controversial anyway, but it happened to air on the same day of the 7-7 London bombings, a terroristic act that shocked the world. The angle was edited out of the European version of the show and came with a warning for US Nigga. viewers. WWE went ahead with the storyline without Hassan appearing on television, but sent the character to his end at the Great American Bash pay-per-view. Once pegged as a future world champ, they had him beat him at the Great American Bash. Like, bro, the amount of shit that Americans do to try to like peel on the heartstrings of like of like patrioticness, I guess is for lack of better words, like is nuts. They had him beat a terrorist wrestler at the Great American Bash so they can get a pop from the crowd. Fucking nuts. Champion, the controversy brought a premature end to Mark Capani's time in the business. Number five, Shag to Death. Late 2002 SmackDown is thought is by that? many to be a golden age for the brand due to the prevalence of the so-called SmackDown 6, as well as the pushes of young up-and-comers like John Cena and Brock Lesnar, supposedly masterminded by head writer Paul Heyman. Next to the sports entertainment silliness of Raw, SmackDown was seen as the proper wrestling show. Well, most of the time anyway. Because around the same time that all that good stuff was happening, one of the main storylines on the show was the affair between and subsequent marriage of Dawn Marie and Tori Wilson. Yo, Trey! Al. Thank you for the the former ECW manager became engaged to the naive Al, who looked like he didn't even know what day of the week it was, then <laughs> tried to bribe Tori Wilson by saying that she would break it off if Tori came to her hotel one night for a little bit of HLA. Tori did, as what? seen at Armageddon 2002, but the engagement remained on, and Dawn and Al eventually married in a balmy televised ceremony. So then Dawn, Sadly, what? I know Al her. and Dawn's marriage came to a premature end, as the old man passed away from a heart attack during the honeymoon, having been, quite literally, shagged to death. Number four, the death of Vince McMahon. Oh goody, more death. Wait well, I'm sure we'd all like- Wait a minute, he ain't died for real, did he now?
Oh, fake deal. I about to say, hold on. Just wait, wait a minute now. Oh, Don Marie, yay! All right, what's this? Go back. To or the death of Vince McMahon. Oh, goody, more death. Well, I'm sure we'd all like to, if we had a chance, shuffle off this mortal up, coil like? like the legend Al Wilson, one of the least preferred deaths. Trey, when are we getting new emotes? Um, let me do this. Hey, do me a favor. If anybody's in that Discord, y'all can make a temporary channel for um, emote suggestions and let people drop them in there. And then I'll, I'll decide which one we're going to put. It's like right now, I can't even think of any good ones. This is probably limousine explosion. They say it's one of the worst ways to go. But that's what happened to Vince McMahon at the climax of the June 11th, 2007 episode of Raw. I After remember this. After cutting a bizarre in-ring speech and walking past his entire roster backstage, I about Vince's this too ride much. went kaboom when he closed the door, ending the broadcast on a soap opera-worthy cliffhanger. Now, obviously, Vince himself didn't really kick the bucket on live TV, but some in the media speculated that the stunt could land the CEO and WWE in hot water. It didn't been what happened. Yes, I told y'all, and I think it's gonna be one of my last time I'm telling y'all. All of this shit took place like when Ben was supposed to come out. It was in the fucking Houston show. They were selling RP Vince McMahon shirts. And me and my brother, I remember we was like, damn, bro, he really did. Like, cause like that's when we was they went on with this shit for a while. I was like, damn, he must be really dead. No, nigga. Particularly where stockholders were concerned. This came to light after WWE ran a story on their website where they speculated that McMahon was presumed dead following the explosion. A and flash, let's not forget w his notes. poor, confused pal Donald Trump, who actually believed his fellow billionaire had perished. In the end, real life tragedy necessitated the end of the Who Done It storyline, with it being revealed later that Vince had faked the whole thing in order to see what people really thought of him. Probably would have just been easier to switch on the internet, you know. Number three, people like you. Booker T may have been a five-time oh. WCW champion, but it took him a while to snatch the main prize in WWE. He finally accomplished it in the summer of oh, 2006, man. but had a few near misses in the years prior. His most high-profile world title pursuit came at WrestleMania 19, where he faced Triple H, who was at that time bang in the middle of his infamous reign of terror. To generate heat for the Mania showdown, <laughs> WWE took things in a very murky direction, emphasizing Booker's previous criminal conviction, while having the game stressed that people like him, as in Booker, weren't championship material. According to Hunter, Booker T, with his nappy hair, was there to dance and entertain oh, people man. like himself. Later on, he ordered Booker to fetch him a towel after he had used the restroom. Like, this storyline is so fucking racist. While the cerebral assassin denied that any part of the feud was deliberately racist, the implications were there crazy. for all to see, Stop and it made it. for deeply uncomfortable viewing. Still, the heroic babyface was going to vanquish the despicable heel at the biggest show of the year, shutting him up and proving him wrong once and for <laughs> No. Pedigree, one, two, three, clean in the middle. Spinner on top of it, they made my nigga lose. Rooney, your ass back to the mid card, sucker! Number two, bestiality sex. What? It's pretty hard to mess up someone like- Oh, Kurt Angle said this shit, bro. Kurt Angle said to Booker T's wife, he wanted to have hot dog. I can't even repeat it. Kurt Angle, the man is a freak athlete, a gosh darned Olympic gold medalist with charisma and intensity dripping out of oh, his every was a maniac, bro. Angle was a team player and also incredibly versatile, effortlessly switching from serious to comedy and able to make just about anything work. The key phrase here though is just about, because try as Kurt might, he couldn't do anything good with the creative plans he was given during his 2005 feud with Booker T and Charmel. Angle became obsessed with Booker's manager and wife, stalking and sexually harassing her in some very icky backstage segments. He also cut some truly outrageous promos outlining his obsession and intention to have perverted bestiality sex with Charmel. I'm not sure the WWE creative folk. Bro, you gotta hear this nigga Kurt Angle, bro. No, 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 no. I'm talking, you know, that, 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 that kind of bestiality sex with your wife. 
Oaks actually bothered to look up the meaning of that word before scripting this dreck, but the former WWE champion sure as hell said it anyway. Angle has said in the years since that this is the one storyline that he regrets doing, feeling like it did nothing for his character or career, and just made him uneasy, given his high respect for Booker and Charmel. Why WWE felt the need to saddle two world-class performers with this type of nonsense, I will never know, but it certainly pushed people's buttons and got them talking, for better or worse. Definitely for worse. Number one, Katie Vick. Though some performers may have had the, the misfortune of being associated with one or two dodgy storylines, poor old Mayor Jacobs' career seemed to be plagued by them. The worst of them all, however, was the Katie Vick debacle. Just saying that name has made me lose whatever stiffy I had. Anyway, Katie Vick was the name of the Big Red Machine's high school sweetheart, and, well, after having one too many and getting behind the wheel one night, Kane apparently ended up crashing the car and killing his best gal. This was all revealed by Triple H, who up... Goddamn wrestling used to be good. <laughs> oh my god, what the fuck? Up to the ante a week later by dressing up in a cane mask and, well, there's no other way of putting this, pretending to have intercourse. Oh god. Oh, I didn't know this part. Oh god with a dummy in a casket. Oh, a God! Line, if you want to call it that, being him literally screwing her brains out. Don't worry, though, because... Oh, God! Kane's tag partner, the Hurricane, got him back, showing the world a film of someone in a Triple H mask receiving an enema and getting a sledgehammer, among many other things, removed from their rectum. Oh, God! It sounds bad, but it was genuinely way, way worse, making Harold and Kumar get the munchies look like the Shawshank Redemption in comparison. Oh, and oh, Triple H what? won the feud relatively easily in the end, obviously. Oh man, I ain't know that nigga did all that shit. What the fuck?